Hi everybody and welcome back to our final discussion of Unit 5, Chapter 19, Sex Differences and Sport and Exercise. So before we get started in our discussion today, I would like to point out something very uh, important um, in terms of what I'll be using today with males, females, men, women, boys, girls. Um, so there's the distinct difference between an individual's biological sex and their gender. So biological sex is um, the biologically determined um, state of an individual. So XX being female, XY being male. Um, and then there's gender, which is kind of a cultural construct of how we choose to identify as either male, female, or something in between. Um, so for the purposes of our discussion today, if I use boys, girls, male, female, um, men, women. I'm using this in the biological context, not the gender context. So just to be clear on that. Um, so when we're talking about the sex differences between males and females, um, you can train a male and a female the same way. Um, biologically, there are not a ton of differences in how the muscles work, how the body responds to aerobic training, anaerobic training. Males and females both respond to the same stimuli. However, the results of that stimuli are going to be slightly different. So, starting first, we're going to look at body composition and body size. Um, so, the first big difference is going to be between testosterone and estrogen. So, testosterone, we typically identify with biological males. Um, and when you have high levels of testosterone, it's going to do a couple of different things. First, it's going to increase your bone formation. Your bones tend to be uh, thicker, stronger, and more stable. Um, also, you, with testosterone, you're going to see an increase in protein synthesis, um, so the larger capabilities of having increased muscle mass, um, increased protein synthesis, increased hormone development. And then finally, you're going to see an increase in erythropoietin, EPO, and red blood cell production. So these individuals can carry oxygen more efficiently. Now, when we look at estrogen, which we tend to associate with individuals that are biologically female, we're going to see a couple differences. So first, you're going to see an increase in fat mass in individuals with high amounts of estrogen versus individuals with high amounts of testosterone, which means there's going to be a significant difference in body composition. This is important because individuals that are biologically female um, need the high levels of body fat in order to successfully carry a pregnancy. Um, so you have to feed the baby. Um, next, uh, individuals with estrogen, we know estrogen is important for closing um, your epiphyseal plates in your long bones, your growth plates. Um, so individuals with high amounts of estrogen are going to have um, quicker and briefer uh, bone formation. Um, also, individuals with high amounts of estrogen tend to be smaller in stature and smaller in body size which is going to make a significant difference when we start talking about muscular strength and uh, cardiovascular endurance. Um, and also, individuals with estrogen tend to lay down fat in a distinctly female pattern. Um, this means that body fat tends to not be carried around the waist, but instead around the hips. This kind of gives that um, stereotypically female pear-shaped body type, right? So, the biggest differences in body composition between males and females is determined by the sex hormones, testosterone, and estrogen. Then, moving into muscular strength, um, there are some distinct differences between males and females. So, we know in the upper body, the females are going to be somewhere between 40 and 60% weaker than the average male. And in the lower body, females are going to be somewhere between 25 and 30% weaker than the average male. Um, and this is because females don't have a ton of upper body muscle mass. However, there is quite a significant amount of lower body muscle mass. Um, and basically, these differences between males and females isn't because women don't respond to training stimuli the same way that men do. It is not a functional difference. It is just because there is a total difference in total muscle mass. They are smaller, therefore they tend to be stronger or weaker. Sorry, they are smaller, so they tend to be weaker. Um, also, women tend to have a smaller cross-sectional area of their muscles. So again, the muscles still work the same way. There's still cross-bridge formation. They still respond to calcium and all the other important things. But because women tend to be smaller, there is less cross-sectional area to grab onto, 
less muscle force to be developed. Um, females, on the other hand, their advantage is they tend to be more fatigue resistant. So females are well adapted for muscular endurance as opposed to muscular power. And then finally, um, when women get stronger, when females get stronger, it tends to be more neural adaptations than true hypertrophy. Women typically do not have as much muscle or um, testosterone available to increase muscle mass. So biological females are going to struggle with putting on high amounts of muscle mass. They can still get stronger, but it tends to be a neurological adaptation as opposed to a physical hypertrophy-based change. All right, then looking at cardiovascular changes. So again, when we look at absolute and relative workloads, because of women's smaller stature, you're typically going to see an in increase in heart rate for that particular load and a decrease in stroke volume. So women in stature tend to be smaller, which means their hearts tend to be smaller, which means they can do the same amount of workload, it's just gonna take more effort. Um, so that means if we're talking at the same absolute intensity, cardiac output would be the same. But when we get into relative submaximal intensities, that cardiac output is going to have to increase. Also, um, females are going to have less hemoglobin and less uh, red blood cells available to them, again, due to smaller stature compared to males. So to compensate, females tend to have a larger AVO2 difference. When, so they're more efficient at pulling oxygen out of their bloodstream. This may also contribute to why females tend to be more fatigue resistant. And then finally, when we're looking at true VO2, so looking at the maximum VO2 for males versus females, females tend to have lower VO2 maxes than males. Again, this comes down to muscle mass and body size. All right. We also know that females tend to have lower peak lactate levels. Um, it tends to fall in the same spot um, compared to where we had expected to relate to the VO2 max. But again, since females' VO2 maxes in general tend to be lower than men's, that means their lactate threshold would then in theory also be lower than men's. So again, you can train men and women exactly the same. Um, you're just gonna see a couple differences and that mostly comes down to which sex hormones are gonna be available and the body size of the individual. Now there are a couple sex-related special situations that we need to be considerate of. Um, the first one I'm going to bring up is pregnancy. So individuals who are pregnant absolutely can exercise and it's actually very beneficial to participate in physical activity and exercise during pregnancy because it helps mitigate negative things like gestational diabetes, um, unnecessary weight gain, um, and just general favorable outcomes for the health of the fetus. Um, however, you do not want to overdo exercise um, when an individual is pregnant because worst case scenario, you can put somebody into preterm labor, which is not good. Um, and also uh, pregnant individuals tend to lean on the carbohydrate uh, substrates a little bit more than we would expect for a particular bout of exercise, which means if you overdo it, you're kind of starving the baby of sugar while it's developing, which is not good. Also, if activities are far too intense, you can lead to the baby becoming hypoxic. Or if you do too much physical activity, um, the mother starts to overheat, which means core body temperature is increased and now the baby is overheating. Um, so as long as you can keep things relatively lower intensity um, and do things safely, physical activity is incredibly healthy and suitable for the woman and her child. Um, the next thing to be considerate of is uh, the bone health of uh, the individual, particularly our females. So it is incredibly important, especially for our young women um, and children to participate in uh, impact loading physical activity. So you can only really kind of bank bone mineral density until your mid twenties to early to mid thirties and then everything after that point, your body's pulling from the bank. Um, so if you have individuals, particularly women, that are not participating in vigorous amounts of impact loading physical activity before the age of 30, and then don't do anything after that, they're gonna end up with an increased risk of osteoporosis and osteopenia. Um, also having adequate substrate intake, so proper nutrition with calcium, and an adequate amount of nutrients is going to be very important 
um, especially for our females. Um, so I've talked a lot about nutrients. So we also need to be aware of things like eating disorders and disordered eating. Um, so eating disorders are going to be a very um, severe situation. It is actually classified as a mental health disorder. Um, so things like um, anorexia nervosa, bulimia, um, these are all going to be related to typically a need to control a situation and it happens to manifest with food. Um, it's going to be very important that these individuals get appropriate treatment and you don't want exercise to kind of exacerbate the situation. Which, now that I've talked about bones and I've talked about eating disorders, I want to kind of pull this together in something very special called the female athlete triad. So the female athlete triad is actually a trio of disorders that hang out together. And as it is implied, it happens to females. Um, so typically what ends up happening is um, one corner of it is going to be uh, loss of bone health. Um, so seeing declines in bone mineral density. Typically, this is replied to the second corner of the female athlete triad, which is eating disorders or dysfunctional or disordered eating. Um, so sometimes this can be as innocent as they just can't eat enough food um, compared to their level of physical activity. Um, so they just can't keep up. So for example, my roommate in college was a rower. She was very, very fit, but she had to consume close to 5,000 calories of food a day if she wanted to break even. Um, that's really hard to do. And actually it's close to impossible to do if you're eating cleanly. Now, if you want to sit down and eat like 15 Krispy Kreme donuts, you can make that happen, but that's not a healthy way to do it. So sometimes females are just working out too hard um, to keep up. Um, other times it does manifest as anorexia or bulimia. Um, and then kind of the third function of that, because you're not getting adequate nutrition and you're overtaxing your body, um, is a disordered menstrual function. Um, so this can be mildly dysfunctional um, menstrual function, which is known as agliomenorrhea. Um, so you're not getting the traditional 10 to 12 periods of year, but it's probably looking at something like six to nine. Um, when you start having less than six periods in a year, we call this um, true menstrual dysfunction or dysmenorrhea or amenorrhea. Um, when you go into this territory, you're no longer getting adequate estrogen circulating around to help with the bones. And now you're at a uh, nutritional deficiency, which is now not helping your bones. And then the nutritional deficiency is making it so you can't have a menstrual cycle. So when all three of these come together, you get the female at the triad. Um, typically, the most the best treatment for this is just making sure somebody eats enough and backing off the exercise a little bit. Um, if it's more of a mental health issue that's leading to this, typically counseling and other things would be beneficial for this individual. Um, and then kind of the last um, situation uh, that's very distinct for women in exercise is going to be exercising during menopause. Um, so menopause is when the uh, woman is transitioning out of her uh, fertile years um, and aging, this usually happens somewhere between the 40s and 50s. Um, and what ends up happening is there's a lot of unfavorable uh, body composition changes. Estrogen is leaving the body, body fats and body composition starts to change. And then there's really bad symptoms like mood swings, hot flashes. Um, and while exercise does not stop uh, or necessarily treat uh, menopause, it can help an individual deal better with the mood swings and those body composition changes. So exercise can be a beneficial in addition to adding a lot of other kind of treatment plans. So hope this was very helpful talking about sex differences uh, with sport and exercise. And I look forward to seeing you guys when we discuss chapter 20 as our first chapter in unit six. Bye.